Now, I always start with, it's, it's a pleasure and an honor to, to, to introduce this particular uh, speaker, but it's a real pleasure tonight to introduce my good friend Felipe Rojas, uh, who is, oh, it was just on the screen, but Associate Professor of Archaeology in the Joukowsky Institute for Archaeology and the Ancient World at Brown University. But Felipe, Professor Rojas, has a, a long career already uh, behind him. He actually started out as an architect. He got his architect degree in 2000 at the uh, University in Bogota in Colombia, his home country. But then at some point he switched to, uh, nice for us, to classics and classical archaeology and he went to NYU and Harvard and eventually in 2010 he received his PhD in classical archaeology uh, from the University of Berkeley in California. Right now uh, we are very happy to have him as a visiting fellow at the prestigious Neubauer uh, collegium, uh, which is around, I'm very bad at orientation, it's there or there, I don't know, but it's, it's, it's around the corner. Um, and uh, he has had similar uh, fellowships at Princeton and the Getty Villa in uh, Los Angeles. Professor Rojas has excavated at many places in Turkey, but right now he, uh, he's still active in Turkey, but right now he conducts archaeological research at the site of Petra in Jordan that I'm sure many of you have uh, visited. He published a, an extremely interesting book in 2019 with Cambridge University Press uh, called The Pasts of Roman Anatolia, Interpreters, Traces, Horizons, which, in which he tackled a topic that I don't think anybody before, certainly not at that uh, extent, had, uh, had undertaken. Um, the sort of the afterlife of ancient monuments, let's say Hittite monuments, but then still in the ancient world. What did Greco-Romans do when they encountered, uh, uh, in this case, Hittite uh, monuments? And um, through his classical uh, uh, background, he had uh, access and, and was able to collect all kinds of classical writers that I had never heard of uh, who indeed write about those encounters in Greco-Roman times. So it's, it's really, uh, and it's very well written, so I can, um, I can recommend to you the pasts of Roman Anatolia, Interpreters, Traces, Horizons. Um, Professor Rojas has also several co-edited volumes, scholarly volumes to his name and many, many articles. Um, and then I read the last lines from his own bio that he is interested in the comparative history of archaeology and antiquarianism worldwide, but especially in the Mediterranean, the Near East, and the Americas. Uh, he's interested, and this is also, I think, extremely interesting, the history and theory of fakes and forgeries. Um, and finally, the archaeology and history of the scripts and languages of ancient Anatolia. And that kind of brings us to this topic along with the, his book that I mentioned to before. So please join me in welcoming Professor Rojas, Felipe Rojas, here to the podium. Thank you very much, uh, Theo, for that very, very generous introduction. And thank you all of you for being here on this uh, cold night. <clears throat> it, is a, it is a great pleasure uh, to speak at the OI and to see dear friends and colleagues and even a former student. Uh, I'm excited to share this, uh, this research with you. My talk tonight concerns what I have called archaeophilia, by which I mean the widespread human impulse to use the material remains of the past to make historical claims. I'm concerned specifically with how Armenian Christians during the second half of the first millennium AD reinterpreted and redeployed local cuneiform inscriptions as part of early Armenian history. The abundance of relevant textual and archaeological sources provides 
really exceptional semantic specificity to many such instances of reuse. And it offers insight into how ruins, and specifically inscribed ruins, have become part of the historical consciousness of people in Eastern Anatolia and in the Southern Caucasus. Uh, let me give you a little bit of the personal genealogy of the project. As Theo mentioned, I have, I have worked um, on and off on, on what Greek, Roman, and, and later interpreters of ruins thought of monuments such as these um, Hittite ones. This is Fasilar, uh, a site that is both a quarry and a Hittite settlement, and it has a giant monolith, a copy of which is in Ankara now. And in the Roman period, uh, a stadium and a place for athletic events was built around this site. Uh, I, I bring a, a photo of Kizilda because James and others here have done uh, really kind of transformational work on this site, um, especially on the on the on the, say, early first millennium history of the site. Here, too, a Roman priest, a Roman or Hellenistic period priest, uh, danced, and, and danced probably in, order, in front of this uh, uh, Iron Age relief, probably to make a lake appear. So I, I, I'm interested in, in this sort of interaction. And uh, more recently, I edited a book about the afterlives of ancient rock-cut monuments. My talk today actually springs from a certain insufficiency in my book, uh, which was that I, what I tried to do was to cast a broad net and try to understand how many different people all over Turkey uh, engage with these monuments. Today I'm going to concentrate on a, on a narrower uh, geographic zone in order to try to explain in, in, more, uh, in more specific detail what is going on with these cases of re-engagement. All but a few of the inscriptions I will mention were written in Urartian during the kingdom of Urartu's heyday between the 9th and the 7th centuries BC. Its rulers held sway from the eastern shores of Lake Van over territories now in the Republic of Armenia, Turkey, Azerbaijan, northern Iraq, and Iran. Many, I mean, and it's really very many Urartian monuments bearing cuneiform inscriptions have been conspicuously exposed since the Iron Age. And at least since the Christianization of Armenia in the 4th and 5th centuries AD, those monuments have been repeatedly involved in debates about Armenian history. Questions about long-term continuities in Armenian cultural memories, and more specifically about the interplay between those memories and the physical traces of the past have interested scholars of the region for decades, if not centuries. Academic awareness of Armenian interest, specifically in what archaeologists call Urartian material remains, goes back at least to the 19th century, when European travelers noted the inclusion of cuneiform inscribed blocks in Armenian churches. And many uh, European travelers through Armenia repeatedly noted seen cuneiform um, uh, used as lintels of Armenian churches. I'll get back to that in a moment. Um, so this is what I plan to do tonight. I'll begin by discussing several 5th century AD Armenian religious texts that shed light on how and why pre-Christian ruins, including specifically Urartian monuments, became the object of intense interest among early Christian Armenian intellectuals. I'll then turn to the work of the fascinating and perplexing medieval Armenian historian, Movses Khorinatsi, uh, first analyzing his explanations of cuneiform inscriptions around Lake Van, and then opening it up and contextualizing his use of cuneiform inscriptions uh, as sources of historical authority. I'll do a little um, detour into, into a strange point of connection between Moses Jorenazzi and Jorge Luis Borges, the Latin American uh, writer. And then I'll turn to the archaeological evidence, and I'll, I'll, I'll give you a survey of reused Urartian inscriptions, uh, mostly from Armenian Christian context, but, but also from other contexts. 
Finally, uh, I'll try to offer a, a sort of historical overview of the changing roles of inscribed realia in late antique and early medieval Armenia. And I'm going to emphasize in particular the relevance of the cuneiform script among people who were and remain exceptionally proud of their own indigenous writing system. I'm interested in knowing how and why Armenians during the second half of the first millennium AD made sense of an ancient described artifacts. And at a more abstract level, I'm concerned with clashes among antiquarian traditions in cases of highly asymmetrical cultural contact. So let's begin with demons in the ruins. <clears throat> in the fourth and fifth centuries AD, monuments associated with non-Christian beliefs became conspicuous and eventually problematic even threatening for Christian intellectuals. Early Armenian theologians and evangelizers repeatedly linked non-Christian realia with superstitions or explained them as physical proof of deviant ways. One, one specific point of, of, of contention concerned the nature of the powerful creatures that were said to dwell amid ancient ruins. And the, the real question was, did such creatures exist? In his refutation of Zoroastrianism and uh, other heretical doctrines, the Armenian theologian and cleric uh, Yeznik Kokobatsi, born in the third quarter of the fourth century AD, preserves tidbits of local lore concerning ruined buildings and abandoned villages. Yeznik argues against the idea that monsters are real and states that such allegedly ruined dwelling beings as the Ishatzul were not actual creatures, but rather mere names coined by people deceived by demons. Tales about the Ishatzul were fables, uh, araspelk in, in Armenian. Yesnik's scholarly refutation of those fables suggests that, according to at least some of his contemporaries, ruins were the residence of demons. Other early Armenian religious authorities were programmatically hostile, not only to the monsters, but also to the ruins themselves. The fifth century hagiographer and historian known as Agathangelos described St. Gregory the Illuminator's uh, sudden and violent reconfiguration of Armenian religious topography in, in, in very vivid passages, uh, passages of a text that became foundational for Armenian religious identity. Ancient material culture was at the core of Gregory's revolutionary conversion project. According to his biographer, Gregory's destruction of pagan temples, shrines, statues, and relics, and his subsequent erection of churches and martyria were authorized by a divine vision. In the passage on screen, Agathangelos, Agathangelos' relentless succession of adjectives emphasizes, I think, the materiality of pagan error. He says, in this way, from many places, Gregory and his followers removed the silent, cast, hammered, beaten, sculpted, useless, profitless, and harmful scandals that were constructed by the witlessness of stupid men. Um, Gregory's program of physical annihilation uh, reaches completion with the raising of temples west of Van, honoring the hero of a Hagen, called the Dragon Handler. Uh, and his spouse, Astik, which is Aphrodite in Greek, and a goddess known as the Golden Mother, uh, which is Anahit. Agathangelos recounts an initial effort on the part of Gregory's followers to find these ruins or these uh, places of pagan error and break down the doors of temples with hammers. And he says, Gregory and his followers were unable to find the gates of the temple in order to enter because the demons had hidden them from them. They tried from the outside, but their iron tools made no impression. The obliteration of temples is finalized not by men, but rather by a selectively, a selectively devastating wind emanating from a wooden cross held by St. Gregory himself. Agathangelos' description of the event emphasizes the agentive powers of the cross against demons and against the structures associated with them. At least twice, Agathangelos describes how during the process of destruction, noisy demons became visible and resisted the fury of the Christians. St. Gregory's extirpation of the pagan temples, altars, and idols 
was allegedly so thorough that absolutely no trace of them was left. The historian's emphatic declaration that the structures had been completely annihilated is part of a widely attested hagiographic trope of miraculous Christian erasure of pre-Christian material culture. Just as a, as a sort of aside, this is a, a 19th century edition of Yeznik, and what is, what, is, what is being portrayed is actually Armenian destruction of pagan books. Uh, but, but the topic of destruction of, of pre-Christian ways is, 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 runs through and through these, these, these authors. Um, these texts uh, reveal Agathangelos' own discomfort at the fact that ruined and other physical traces of the pagan past and present were and indeed still are found throughout Armenia. So the question is, do extant, extant Urartian artifacts and monuments attest in any way to Christian wrath in the 4th and 5th centuries AD? Is there other traces of this stuff? Well, not very conspicuously, if at all. Agathangelos claims that after Gregory and his men uh, were done with the structures, it did not appear that there had been anything there in the first place. It's kind of hard to point to pulverized traces of non-Christian material culture. But evidence may not be altogether lacking, as suggested in the discussion of, uh, of extant archaeological evidence further below. One point in particular is the motive of hidden or impenetrable doors in Agatangelos' description, um, which uh, since the early 20th century, uh, initially Russian scholars and then others have suggested these impenetrable doors may actually be the... Uh, Sort of religious niches uh, of Urartian kings as those found in the Acropolis of Van. And in addition to that, uh, throughout the, the Van Kalesi, there are uh, inscribed crosses associated with almost every niche that you find there. <clears throat> in the writings of Yesnik and Nagathangelos, a reader can catch glimpses, not just of interest in ruins, and this is important, but of conflicting and even contradictory interest in non-Christian and pre-Christian realia. So, Yesnik uh, dismissed the existence of monsters, but his treatise militates directly against people who be believed in powerful creatures that dwelt in, those, in, in ruins. St. Gregory clamored for the destruction of pagan idols and temples, and according to his biography, demons forcefully resisted uh, his destructive efforts, and I imagine that in addition to demons, demons, there were actual people who held out against the material obliteration of Armenians' non-Christian religious landscape. The priests of active Zoroastrian fire temples, most obviously, but also locals who adhered to non-Christian inherited Caucasian traditions. At any rate, in the 4th and 5th centuries AD, a new Christian identity in Armenia was forged partly by taking different positions vis-a-vis -vis ruins in the region, including specifically Urartian ones. Okay. Independently of religious controversies, ruins in Armenia had long been part of local historical consciousness. They were associated not only with monsters and demons, but also with the protagonists of local and transregional myth history. Insights into those, again, conflicting traditions can be gleaned from the writings of the frustratingly elusive historian Movses Khorenatsi, who wrote around the third quarter of the first millennium AD and whose exact dates remain contested. Movses sometimes mentions and etymologizes uh, local toponyms seemingly associated with ruins, including, for example, a place called Geddes Mank, uh, which literally means the tombs, and it's the purported site of a uh, gigantomachy. Another place, Airadat, which he associates with the early mythological uh, hero uh, and ruler, Ara. These toponyms and the retelling of exploits of local uh, heroes and giants served the historian to connect the remote Armenian past to, to biblical history via extant material traces and legendary genealogies. But, but it gets more interesting because Moses transmits local tales 
that revolve around ruins. And of particular interest is a passage in which the historian relates songs sung by people living around Lake Van, which seem to account specifically for the existence of ancient rock-cut carvings and inscriptions. I've, I've mentioned this passage before in some of my articles. They, the people around Lake Van, sang that the giant Torque took in his fist granite rocks in which there was no crack, and he would crunch them into large and small pieces at will, polish them with his nails, and, from, and form them into tablet shapes, and likewise with his nails, inscribe eagles and other such designs on them. Um, it's not entirely clear whether the songs the historian mentions were still sung by uh, his own contemporaries in the 7th or 8th centuries AD, or whether he somehow had access to content of songs no longer sung. Regardless, the giant torque is not an ad hoc addition invented by Moses to provide local color to his narrative. He's actually diffident about the veracity of the orally transmitted fable. He also calls it a narraspel. Um, I, I'm convinced, and so are others, that the historian's report about a giant's tablet-shaped stones and zoomorphic doodles reflects vernacular understanding of rock-cut monuments around Lake Van. What the people around the lake explain as Torque's graphic musings are almost certainly what our modern archaeologists identify as bronze and iron monuments and artifacts. The nail scratches uh, may correspond to, to rock and stone cut cuneiform inscriptions as found on the east side of the Acropolis of Van. While the eagles and uh, zoomorphic designs may be the fine carvings uh, of the temple of Haldi in Ayanis, uh, a little bit north of Van. And here you see both the Urartian and the, and the orthostats with uh, animal, uh, animal carvings. Moses' own position regarding ruins around Lake Van, Van is best understood in the light of other passages of his work where the historian attempts to incorporate inscribed antiquities uh, in Armenia into universal history. He sometimes claims to have access to records relevant to very, very early Armenian history written in foreign languages and scripts, uh, specifically what he calls Chaldean, Assyrian, and Persian. Of, of particular importance is a passage in which the historian associates ancient realia bearing text with the semi-mythological -myth Mesopotamian queen Semiramis, uh, this, is, this is one of those passages, there are more. He says, on the side of the rock that faces the sun, on which today no one can scratch a line with an iron point, Semiramis had carved out various temples and chambers and treasure houses and wide caverns. No one knows how she formed such wonderful constructions. And over the entire surface of the rock, smoothing it like wax with a stylus, she inscribed many texts, the mere sight of which makes anyone marvel. And not only this, but also in many places in the land of Armenia, she set up stele and ordered memorials to herself to be written in that same script. And in many places, she fixed the boundaries with the same writing. Moses' description have incited scholars to speculate about the specific material remains uh, that the historian had in mind when describing the traces of Semiramis. There's, there's, I think there's, there's no doubt that what he mentions are Iron Age realia, including fortresses, rock-cut niches, cuneiform inscriptions, masonry, freestanding stele, aqueducts. Um, <clears throat> extant stones inscribed in ancient and foreign scripts around Van were material proof of his particular version of local and universal history. Obviously, he could not read cuneiform, nor could any of his contemporaries. But those inscriptions made it possible for Moses to claim, with little risk of refutation, that he had somehow gained access to specific semantic content of very, very ancient texts. <clears throat> so I think what's interesting is that Moses preserves evidence of at least two different traditions of archaeophilia concerning cuneiform rock-cut inscriptions and stone stele. On the one hand, he transmits fragments of, of, of vernacular narratives, 
explaining such realia as the handiwork of, of a primordial giant torque. On the other hand, he interprets rock cut inscriptions and stele as the dispersed records of ancient Mesopotamian rulers. Um, Torque has been associated sometimes by Armenian scholars and others with the sort of uh, understood as an Armenian ref reflex of Tarhuntas or, or Tarhunt, the Anatolian uh, storm god. Um, I, I don't think one should draw too sharp a uh, distinction between sort of vernacular uh, expressions of archaeophilia and, and elite ones. I think there's a lot of interaction. The two narratives are actually not fully contradictory and, in fact, share some salient common traits. And I think one of the most interesting ones is that Moses repeatedly emphasizes the ease with which both Semiramis and Torque could and did act uh, upon stone, whether carving, crunching, scratching, or inscribing it. Both interpretations were agreed on this point. Whoever had carved those stones had done so seemingly without effort. The ease with which Torque and Semiramis incised stones is sort of a retrojection and inversion of Agathangelos' report about the Christian fanatics' initial attempt to hack at the doors of temples that I just mentioned. Okay, now this is my little excursus on, uh, on Moses Hrenazzi and Borges. In 1993, the, the French historian Jean-Pierre Maé made a bold interpretive maneuver in the introduction to his translation of the history of the Armenians. He invoked the prologue that the Argentinian writer Jorge Luis Borges had written to his celebrated collection uh, of short stories, Ficciones, in order to illuminate Moses' own historical method. In Ficciones, Borges had said that rather than expand the cumbersome and senseless effort of writing lengthy books, it was better to simulate that those books already existed and to provide summaries or commentaries of them. Maez's use of Borges to, limit, to illuminate Moses uh, may be refined to analyze specifically his incorporation of inscribed antiquities into his narrative. <clears throat> it's useful to remember uh, that Moses claims that the first part of his own work, the, the first, really, basically the first, was the first book of his own work, which deals with very, very early Armenian history, partly derived from an earlier history originally written in a language and script other than Armenian. So he, he, he presents his own work as a translation from, from another book. He takes delight in explaining the very complicated history of transmission of that original text. According to him, a Syrian by the name of Mar Abbas Katina, acting as an envoy of King Vologases, went to Nineveh, and in that city's archives found a book written in Greek, which proclaimed to contain the authentic account of the ancients and ancestors, allegedly translated at the command of Alexander the Great from the Chaldean language into Greek. There's a lot of levels of translation, doesn't matter, but there's many levels of translation here. He goes on to say that Mar Abbas Katina made an extract of the portion of the book specifically relevant to Armenia, produced both Greek and Syriac copies of it, and gave them to King Bologasis. The learned king not only treasured this gift, but also had a portion of it inscribed on a stila in Nisibis, uh, in Nusaybin in Turkey. Intriguingly, uh, the author of a different early Armenian historical tract known as the Primary History, the author is sometimes called Sebeos, preserves a slightly different version of the tale of Mara Baskatina. Sebeos claims to have personally inspected a stele bearing the inscription containing portions of Mar Abbas Katina's translation of the original Chaldean text in the ruins of a royal palace uh, in Metsurn. The historicity of Mar Abbas Katina, his translation of the Chaldean book, and the inscribed stele of the Armenian king are all suspect. Even so, despite divergent details, at least two Armenian historiographers used a literary trope in ancient, uh, I mean, borrowed from ancient Greek literature and sort of mischievously adapted it uh, to their own narratives. 
I think one could argue that Moses actually outdoes Borges. Uh, for Moses stimulates that lengthy historical texts existed, summarizes and comments on them, but also, and, and I think this is a really important part, points to very real inscribed monuments on which some of those historical texts had purportedly been written. It's not only that he invents the books, he then, he then points to the, to the originals. Moses invoked lost or otherwise hard to access text in foreign and ancient scripts, as some of his own Greek predecessors had done, but he did not, did, he did not outright invent the cuneiform inscriptions and around Lake Van. Those inscriptions were there for anyone to see. They were rather like, like the surviving loose pages of no longer complete historical volumes. In some ways, they were inscrutable, but very much visible and tangible fragments of the local past that provided a physical ballast to his own literary tropes. Their exact semantic context was hard, but for Moses, not impossible to ascertain. According to him, those stones contained tracts of the origins of the Armenians. They were, they were a textual prehistory of Armenia, as it were. Okay. Um, sorry. I'm going to turn now to the archaeological evidence. So I've been, I've been talking so far about texts that involve uh, ancient rock and stone cut carvings and inscriptions. Um, but inscribed Urartian stela reused by Armenian Christians abound, even though they have been and, and they continue to be the victims of systematic hostility outside of the Republic of Armenia. I'm going to show you two maps just, just to give you a sense of where of the distribution of the stones that I'm talking about. So uh, zoom in on, on Lake Van with uh, many of the stones uh, that come from the east side and then a uh, rather zoomed out map uh, with some of the other uh, stele that I will mention, including one uh, very far west of my region that, that some of you will know well because it contains an Anatolian hieroglyphic inscription from uh, Armenian Nagarak or Erek in Turkish. Okay. So Urartian and, and other Iron Age carvings were often modified by the addition of simple crosses. And those crosses often avoid uh, or barely damage pre-existing cuneiform signs. They're frequently found on rock-cut inscriptions and niches. For example, on the Acropolis of Van, they're everywhere on Van. Um, also in places like Orta Damla, north of the lake, and occasionally, you also find uh, painted uh, crosses, uh, for example, at, at one of the uh, big niches in Van called uh, Hazine Kapisi. Most of these interventions are absolutely impossible to date. But by the 7th century AD, at the latest and perhaps earlier, some Urartian inscribed stele were incorporated in the fabric of churches around Van, including that of uh, Aswat Satsin, uh, in what is now called uh, Salmana. Several, of, 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 several cuneiform inscribed blocks were used as lintels. Many of these lintels have been destroyed because the churches have been destroyed. But, but thankfully, uh, some in Armenia survive, or some, some Urartian inscribed blocks survive in Armenia. Cristina Maranci has elucidated the remarkable case of an Iron Age stela found largely undamaged in an early medieval church. No intervention at all was made on that stone originally commissioned by the Urartian king Rusa II in the 7th century BC. In Christina's opinion, the Urartian inscribed stele in the 7th century AD church of Svartnots does not suggest a monument out of place in a local context. This, this is not a, a stone out of place, but rather a visible and tangible attempt on the, on the part of a powerful religious ruler to use the stone to situate his new patriarchate without an, within an expansive cultural milieu mounting a local shrine on the world stage. The stone was used to, to, to make the church more cosmopolitan. <clears throat> Some Armenian recarvings of Urartian inscribed realia include much, much more ambitious figural scenes than simple crosses. This round-top stela, which comes from Patnos and is now in Van, 
was originally carved on both sides and later adorned on the verso with a large Armenian cross with flaring arms that stands on a podium. The cross and podium uh, are further adorned with, uh, with bold vegetal flourishes and, and then uh, two human figures of indeterminate gender uh, flank a bottom lower cross. What I want, to, what I want you to, to, to note in this example is that the, 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 Armenian, the Christian Armenian intervention does not damage cuneiform signs. It, it actually respects many of the cuneiform signs, and this is a recurrent trait in these, in, these, um, in these cases of reuse. It happens at many scales. Um, even small fragments that are, that are much more fragmentary are often found with crosses that effectively do not interact or do not destroy the, the, the cuneiform. From Sike comes a stone now kept in Tbilisi, bearing cuneiform text uh, on both sides, and on the verso, a stylized linear cross of Lorraine with short lower arms um, on a sort of invent inverted triangular podium. So this cross partially destroys a few cuneiform signs, but it allows much of the cuneiform text to remain visible. Another stone, now lost uh, from, from Hargin, was inscribed with two Armenian crosses uh, and a short Armenian inscription, carefully inscribed on the upper surface of the stone. Again, note the interaction between cuneiform signs and text. This round-top stela with a cuneiform text from Casimolu um, has a fine cross and a step podium incised on the verso, along with an Armenian uh, inscription. The cross damages only a, or the crosses damage only a handful of cuneiform signs. Um, here too, the Iraqian cuneiform is deliberately left mostly undisturbed. Sometimes the interplay between the Urartian cuneiform signs and the subsequent cross or crosses is much more intricate than in the example just mentioned. In this Cruz Gemata uh, on a step platform, an Armenian inscription was carved on Urartian stele with cuneiform text on both sides. Uh, this, this, is an this is an especially interesting uh, example because the, the Armenian intervention and the cuneiform are upside down with respect to each other, as it were. Um, this stone also has been destroyed, and only a, a squeeze, a, a fine squeeze, survives. In at least one famous case of reuse, the original cuneiform text has been deliberately made part of the newly carved cross's ornament. The recto of an Urartian stele inscribed on both sides found in the ruins of the 5th or 6th century AD church of Tanahat and now in the Yerevan Museum was thoroughly recarved with an Armenian cross with, flor uh, with floral and other decorations. Although the original cuneiform text on the side of the stone was largely destroyed, the remains of characters provide a conspicuous lace-like texture to the cross. And that lace-like texture is very reminiscent of some of the most elaborate, elaborate uh, Hachkar stones, the, the Armenian uh, cross stones, which I'll show more in a minute. <clears throat> it's, it's also worth remembering that uh, the giant torque was said to crunch granite rocks into large and small pieces at will and polish them with his hand. I suggested above that what Moses Khrenatsi had in mind uh, were those beautiful and, and monumental um, zoomorphic carvings on the orthostats from the Temple of Ayanis in Van. But there's at least one stele bearing Anatolian hieroglyphs reused by an Armenian Christian. The stone was found in the village of Erek in Cappadocia, far west of Van. Erek is, is, as I mentioned in passing, the, the Turkish uh, rendering of uh, Armenian Agarak. This redeployment has received little attention, uh, but it likely occurred in the third quarter of the first millennium AD. 
here too, the Iron Age Anatolian hieroglyphic text was, was sort of respected, even if the figurative imagery the stele may have once borne was erased. Such avoidance of cuneiform and hieroglyphic signs is not a coincidence. It's a deliberate act on the part of the reuser. In the Iron Age, the Urartians themselves had redeployed prehistoric engraved statuary. This is a remarkable example of repeated reuse ranging over several millennia. It's originally uh, a prehistoric uh, dragon stone of Vishapkar uh, that was uh, taken by the King Argishti I, the, the Urartian King Argishti I, and brought down from the mountains to the plain. Then that re-inscribed uh, Vishap with the Urartian text was, was incorporated into a Hellenistic fortress some 20 kilometers east of Yerevan. The Urartian inscription of Argishti I commemorates a military triumph in the mountains. Since most uh, dragon stones, Vishapkar, are found at high altitude, it is conceivable that Argishti purloined and brought that stone down to Garni specifically to, comm to commemorate the mountain triumph. The Hellenistic reuse may have been merely for convenience during the erection of the fortress at Garni, but the rock's more recent extraction for the fabric of the fortress has turned it once again into a valuable antiquity. Almost any of the stones that I have shown you have really rich and, 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 I, and I think exciting biographies. And, and I hope that more, more attention is paid to them because they're, they're being destroyed as I speak. Okay, let me, let me begin to conclude. Long before the Christianization of Armenia, ancient material remains, including specifically Urartian realia, had been reused in the region. Throughout the first millennium AD, inscribed Urartian stelia were recurrent sites of contact and conflict for people with conflicting ideas about the local past and their connection to anthropogenic traces. If you read the theologians against the grain, those literary sources provide insight into the roles inscribed monuments played in the historical consciousness of multiple local inhabitants. Archaeological evidence is, is, is abundant, much more abundant than the material that I have studied in Turkey, but it is frustratingly hard to date and to interpret. Even so, I'm going to try to offer some general reflections about kind of the arc of reuse. There's, there's, as I said, there's, 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 a, uh, there's abundant evidence of this type of, of interaction. So some modern scholars have suggested that Bronze and Iron Age inscribed stele, reused in religious contexts, may have sometimes served apotropaic purposes. Apotropaic is a little bit vague in this, in this use, uh, but whatever it means, I think it's more likely to be the case in mosques than in churches. Cuneiform reused in mosques is often reused in such ways as to make the, the, the cuneiform text invisible or intentionally placed so that people step on it. This is a, an example from Celebibai in Turkey. And as you can see, it had originally been reused by a Christian, then erased, and then placed on the floor in Celebibai. Uh, some of you probably have seen this, this stone before. It's the stele of King Nabonidus from the beautiful city of Haran in Turkey that was placed on the entrance to the mosque in order that people uh, step on it. Uh, a slightly different and, and, and perhaps more interesting uh, example of reuse is, is this inscription from the al Khan Mosque in Aleppo, uh, a hieroglyphic Anatolian inscription that perhaps had talismanic purposes. This sort of reuse is not very common at all among Christian Armenians. Okay, so what did Christian Armenians do? So some of the early, uh, some of the simple crosses inscribed on extant Urartian stele may arguably be as early as the fifth century AD and perhaps reflect the process of Christianization of realia described by the historian Agatangelos. Perhaps they are material reminders either of devotion for the miraculous power of the wooden cross of Gregory or of the efforts of Christians who may have continued to associate monsters and demons with ruins, even against the teachings of Yesnik and other religious authorities. 
the sort of learned historical speculations favored by Moses, who associates cuneiform inscriptions around Van with the rulers of early Mesopotamian emperors, may have a material counterpart in some of the earliest datable reused Urartian spolia in Armenian churches. The redeployment of Urartian stele as lintels or corner blocks of churches with the cuneiform exposed precludes explaining, their away, uh, explaining away their reuse simply as a result of the stone's availability. They're placed in really key spots. By the seventh century AD at the latest, Urartian stele were redeployed by powerful Armenian religious authorities in Christian context. Um, and and, and the, the, the stone at Svartnots is one of the most, most obvious ones. The Christianization of the Caucasus and the simultaneous invention of new alphabets for three of the many indigenous languages of the regions, the invention of Armenian, Georgian, and Caucasian Albanian, I think triggered a reassessment of whatever prior histories Armenian-speaking communities may have had. The invention of the alphabets triggered a reconsideration of what cuneiform was. In order to understand Armenian fascination with Urartian inscribed stele, it is necessary to consider briefly the history of writing in the Caucasus. Writing had been used in Armenia for millennia prior to the invention of the Armenian alphabet in the early 5th century AD. Inscriptions in hieroglyphic Anatolian, uh, cuneiform like in Old Persian and Urartian, and alphabetic scripts such as Arma Aramaic and Greek are found in territories traditionally inhabited by the Armenians. Other scripts, though not attested, would have been used by people who are known to have been in the region, such as Phoenician and Phrygian. Historical records, both in Armenian and in various other languages, attest to the existence of literate kingdoms ruling over the Armenian highlands. Many of the inhabitants of the region would have seen and interacted with local Bronze and Iron Age texts carved on stone. Within a century of the invention of the Armenian alphabet around the, uh, 400 AD, local Armenian historians were producing indigenous accounts of Armenian history in an original Armenian script. That new alphabet was an ev evangelizing tool, and it became such a fundamental part of the cultural and historical transformation of Armenian-speaking peoples that one of the earliest texts in that alphabet is a hagiography of the inventor of the alphabet. When the Armenian alphabet spread through Armenia, contrast with other available and well-established writing systems, including Pahlavi, Greek, and Syriac, was desired. The alphabet was, was invented specifically to contrast with Greek, Syriac, and, and uh, Pahlavi. The new script marked a deliberate and stark contrast in the visual appearance of all its alphabetic signs with respect to its source. To this day, uh, the visual and material expression of the Armenian and Georgian alphabets remain defining aspects of the religious and national identity of what are now the Republic of Armenia and Georgia. Uh, this is just, uh, just a table to show that the, the Armenian alphabet is ultimately structured according to the Greek order, but the letters themselves, many of them, are, are, are very distant from the Greek sources, let's say. <clears throat> Moses and some of his contemporaries cared about inscribed antiquities because they wanted to reach back deep into local history, deeper than the advent of Christianity and the invention of the Armenian alphabet. The translation of extant, extant uh, cuneiform inscriptions allowed for a temporal and historical counterpoint to St. Gregory's spatial and topographic transformation of the Armenian religious landscape. With the new alphabet, with the Armenian alphabet, the present and future could now be imagined as, and written uh, as, Christi as Christian Armenian times. But the past required not a new but an old script. Ancient descriptions around Lake Van were neither in the Armenian language nor in the Armenian alphabet, but they were evidently in Armenia. And according to many or some Armenian writers, they recorded the names of Armenian ancestors and the deeds of those ancestors, even if they did so in Chaldean. Urartian inscriptions could be used as instruments with which to authorize a pre-Christian Armenian history. Critically, cuneiform allowed the extension into the past 
of the most important trait of the new Armenian alphabet, the possibility of establishing a deliberate and stark contrast with existing writing systems. For people like Moses, and perhaps also for, for some religious authorities, those steely authorized and confirmed a newly discovered Armenian history, one that accorded with the Bible and also with secular Greek universal history, but also, at least in detail, was fully distinct and fully local. Um, yeah, I, I think Kinuform allowed, uh, in some ways, uh, a, re, a recapturing of the local past away from, from Persian, and imperial, Persian and Roman imperial uh, narratives. By the 9th century AD, Urartia and Stili were used even more widely to celebrate Armenian Christian identity. A frequent form of reuse of Urartia and Stili involves the carving of a large sculpted cross that occupies most of the surface of the stone, transforming the stele into a Christian tombstone. When this specific type of reuse first started to happen is unclear, but by around the 9th century AD, under the kings of the Christian Bagratid dynasty, Armenian sculptors began carving the spectacular and distinctive Armenian stone monuments known as uh, Khachkars. These cross stones are rectangular stele adorned with a main central cross surrounded by decoration, often exquisitely intricate, lace-like. Scholars have noted that, that these cross stones are somehow related to reused Urartian cuneiform stele, although it is unclear whether the carving of crosses on reused Urartian stele incited the production of Khachkars, or whether it was the other way around, <clears throat> that the Khachkars incited the reuse of Urartian stele. At any rate, the Armenian Christians who commissioned the reuse of Urarti and Stili as crosses were not hostile, obviously, to the original cuneiform text those, those, text, those Stili bore. The process of reinterpretation has not ceased. A remarkable case of more recent reuse involves a, a Stili found in Kizilkaya, originally commissioned by King Menua, uh, the 9th century Urartian king, it was recarved to bear a cross an eight lines, uh, and an eight-line Armenian inscription. The Armenian text, which was inscribed in 1755, is lined as if to imitate a book or perhaps to acknowledge an aesthetic and historical connection with cuneiform inscriptions. In the stele from Kizil uh, Kaya, Urartian cuneiform signs and the Armenian alphabetic characters jointly communicate a single message, the depth of Armenian history. Urartian stele continued to be part of Armenian historical consciousness of local antiquities and markers of contrast. In the early 20th century AD, Urartian realia served precisely that double function. As the, new leader, as the leaders of the new Republic of Turkey claimed the Hittite uh, past as their own and the Hittites as their ancestors, Armenian communities and artists celebrated Urartian kings and the traces of the Urartian past as their own this is, a, this is um, an illustration from, from a, a, a book of a collection of Armenian legends and, and poems. And what you're seeing is King Ara looking over the, the founding of Van. As you can tell, uh, the illustration is actually informed by what were at the time really recent archaeological discoveries. And, uh, and uh, Zabel Boyajan was thinking about those recent archaeological discoveries to picture uh, an Armenian prehistory, as it were. I want to note that this, this uh, painting was painted in 1916. And, uh, and to, to remind all of us that as that painting was painted, the genocide of Armenian uh, Christians in eastern Turkey was occurring. Um, and here you see... Uh, Armenian soldiers and fighters um, defending the city of Van. Uh, even as I read uh, these words, the process continues. The, the stele from uh, Kizilkaya and the ruins of the ancient church associated with it were blown up recently, demonstrating that as much as in the 21st, as in the 5th century, these stones are threatened because they are charged with power and meaning and because they continue to make history. Thank you.
For over 100 years, the OI has been a leading research center for the study of ancient Middle Eastern civilizations. Join us in uncovering the past and learn about the beginnings of our lives as humans together. Become a member by visiting oi.uchicago.edu slash member.